The Everlasting Man by G. K. Chesterton Chapter 3 The Antiquity of Civilization The modern man looking at the most ancient origins has been like a man watching for daybreak in a strange land and expecting to see that dawn breaking behind bare uplands or solitary peaks. But that dawn is breaking behind the black bulk of great cities long builded and lost for us in the original night. Colossal cities like the houses of giants in which even the carved ornamental animals are taller than the palm trees in which the painted portrait can be twelve times the size of the man with tombs like mountains of man set four square and pointing to the stars, with winged and bearded bulls standing and staring enormous at the gates of temples. Standing still eternally as if a stamp would shake the world, the dawn of history reveals a humanity already civilized. Perhaps it reveals a civilization already old, and among other more important things, it reveals the folly of most the generalizations about the previous and unknown period when it was really young. The two first human societies of which we have any reliable and detailed record are Babylon and Egypt. It so happens that these two vast and splendid achievements of the genius of the ancients bear witness against two of the commonest and crudest assumptions of the culture of the modern. If we want to get rid of half the nonsense about nomads and cavemen and the old man of the forest, we need only look steadily at the two solid and stupendous facts called Egypt and Babylon. Of course, most of these speculators who are talking about primitive men are thinking about modern savages. They prove their progressive evolution by assuming that a great part of the human race has not progressed or evolved, or even changed in any way at all. I do not agree with their theory of change, nor do I agree with their dogma of things unchangeable. I may not believe the civilized man has had so rapid and recent a progress, but I cannot quite understand why uncivilized man should be so mystically immortal and immutable. A somewhat simpler mode of thought and speech seems to me to be needed throughout this inquiry. Modern savages cannot be exactly like primitive man because they are not primitive. Modern savages are not ancient because they are modern. Something has happened to their race as much as to ours during the thousands of years of our existence and endurance on the earth. They have had some experiences and have presumably acted on them, if not profited by them like the rest of us. They have had some environment and even some change of environment and have presumably adapted themselves to it in a proper and decorous evolutionary manner. This would be true even if the experiences were mild or the environment dreary, for there is an effect in mere time when it takes the moral form of monotony. But it has appeared to a good many intelligent and well-informed people quite as probable that the experience of the savages has been that of a decline from civilization. Most of those who criticize this view do not seem to have any very clear notion of what a decline from civilization would be like. Heaven help them, it is likely enough that they will soon find out. They seem to be content if cave men and cannibal islanders have some things in common, such as certain particular implements. But it is obvious on the face of it that any peoples reduced for any reason to a ruder life would have some things in common. If we lost all our firearms, we should make bows and arrows. But we should not necessarily resemble in every way the first men who made bows and arrows. It is said that the Russians in their great retreat were so short of armament that they fought with clubs cut in the wood.
but a professor of the future would err in supposing that the Russian army of 1916 was a naked Scythian tribe that had never been out of the wood. It is like saying that a man in his second childhood must exactly copy his first. A baby is bald like an old man, but it would be an error for one ignorant of infancy to infer that the baby had a long white beard. Both the baby and an old man walk with difficulty, but he who shall expect the old gentleman to lie on his back and kick joyfully instead will be disappointed. It is therefore absurd to argue that the first pioneers of humanity must have been identical with some of the last and most stagnant leavings of it. There were almost certainly some things, there were probably many things, in which the two were widely different or flatly contrary. An example of the way in which this distinction works, and an example essential to our argument here, is that of the nature and origin of government. I have already alluded to Mr. H. G. Wells and the old man with whom he appears to be on such intimate terms. If we consider the cold facts of prehistoric evidence for this portrait of the prehistoric chief of the tribe, we can only excuse it by saying that its brilliant and versatile author simply forgot for a moment that he was supposed to be writing a history and dreamed he was writing one of his own very wonderful and imaginative romances. At least I cannot imagine how he can possibly know that the prehistoric ruler was called the old man or that court etiquette requires it to be spelt with capital letters. He says of the same potentate, no one was allowed to touch his spear or to sit in his seat. I have difficulty in believing that anybody has dug up a prehistoric spear with a prehistoric label. Visitors are requested not to touch or a complete throne with inscription reserved for the old man, but it may be presumed that the writer, who can hardly be supposed to be merely making up things out of his own head, was merely taking for granted this very dubious parallel between the prehistoric and the de-civilized man. It may be that in certain savage tribes, the chief is called the old man and nobody is allowed to touch his spear or sit on his seat. It may be that in those cases, he is surrounded with superstitious and traditional terrors. And it may be that in those cases, for all I know, he is despotic and tyrannical. But there is not a grain of evidence that primitive government was despotic and tyrannical. It may have been, of course, for it may have been anything or even nothing. It may not have existed at all, but the despotism in certain dingy and decayed tribes in the 20th century does not prove that the first men were ruled despotically. It does not even suggest it. It does not even begin to hint at it. If there is one fact we really can prove from the history that we really do know, it is that despotism can be a development, often a late development, and very often indeed the end of societies that have been highly democratic. A despotism may almost be defined as a tired democracy. As fatigue falls in a community, the citizens are less inclined for that internal vigilance, which has truly been called the price of liberty, and they prefer to arm only one single sentinel to watch the city while they sleep. It is also true that they sometimes needed him for some sudden and militant act of reform. It is equally true that he often took advantage of being the strong man armed to be a tyrant, like some of the sultans of the East. But I cannot see why the sultan should have appeared any earlier in history than many other human figures. On the contrary, the strong man armed obviously depends upon the superiority of his armor. An armament of that sort comes with more complex civilization. One man may kill twenty with a machine gun. It is obviously less likely that he could do it with a piece of flint. As for the current cant about the strongest man ruling by force and fear, it is simply a nursery fairy tale about a giant with 
hundred hands. Twenty men could hold down the strongest strong man in any society, ancient or modern. Undoubtedly, they might admire, in a romantic and poetical sense, the man who was really the strongest. But that is quite a different thing, and is as purely moral and even mystical as the admiration for the purest or the wisest. But the spirit that endures the mere cruelties and caprices of an established despot is the spirit of an ancient and settled and probably stiffened society, not the spirit of a new one. As his name implies, the old man is the ruler of an old humanity. It is far more probable that a primitive society was something like a pure democracy. To this day, the comparatively simple agricultural communities are by far the purest democracies. Democracy is a thing which is always breaking down through the complexity of civilization. Anyone who likes may state it by saying that democracy is the foe of civilization. But he must remember that some of us really prefer democracy to civilization in the sense of preferring democracy to complexity. Anyhow, peasants tilling patches of their own land in a rough equality and meeting to vote directly under a village tree are the most truly self-governing of men. It is surely as likely as not that such a simple idea was found in the first condition of even simpler men. Indeed, the despotic vision is exaggerated even if we do not regard the men as men. Even on an evolutionary assumption of the most materialistic sort, there is really no reason why men should not have had at least as much camaraderie as rats or rooks. Leadership of some sort they doubtless had as have the gregarious animals, but leadership implies no such irrational servility as that attributed to the superstitious subjects of the old man. There was doubtless somebody corresponding to use Tennyson's expression to the many wintered crow that leads the clanging rookery home. But I fancy that if that venerable fowl began to act after the fashion of some sultans in ancient and decayed Asia, it would become a very clanging rookery and the many wintered crow will not see many more winters. It may be remarked in this connection, but even among animals, it would seem that something else is respected more than bestial violence. If it be only the familiarity which in men is called tradition or the experience which in men is called wisdom, I do not know if crows really follow the oldest crow, but if they do, they are certainly not following the strongest crow. And I do know in the human case that if some ritual of seniority keeps savages reverencing somebody called the old man, then at least they have not our own servile sentimental weakness for worshipping the strong man. It may be said then that primitive government, like primitive art and religion and everything else, is very imperfectly known or rather guessed at, but that it is at least as good a guess to suggest that it was as popular as a Balkan or Pyrenean village as that it was as capricious and secret as a Turkish divan. Both the mountain democracy and the oriental palace are modern in the sense that they are still there, or are some sort of growth of history. But of the two, the palace has much more the look of being an accumulation and a corruption than village, much more the look of being a really unchanged and primitive thing. But my suggestions at this point do not go beyond expressing a wholesome doubt about the current assumption. I think it interesting, for instance, that liberal institutions have been traced, even by moderns, back to barbarian or undeveloped states, when it happened to be convenient for the support of some race or nation or philosophy. So the socialists profess that their ideal of communal property existed in very early times. So the Jews are proud of the jubilees or juster redistributions under their ancient law. So the Teutonists boasted of tracing parliaments 
and juries and various popular things among the Germanic tribes of the north. So the Celtophiles and those testifying to the wrongs of Ireland have pleaded the more equal justice of the clan system to which the Irish chiefs bore witness before a strong bow. The strength of the case varies in the different cases. But as there is some case for all of them, I suspect there is some case for the general proposition that popular institutions of some sort were by no means uncommon in early and simple societies. Each of these separate schools were making the admission to prove a particular modern thesis. But taken together, they suggest a more ancient and general truth that there was something more in prehistoric councils than ferocity and fear. Each of these separate theorists had his own axe to grind, but he was willing to use a stone axe and he manages to suggest that the stone axe might have been as republican as the guillotine. But the truth is that the curtain rises upon the play already in progress. In one sense, it is a true paradox that there was history before history, but it is not the irrational paradox implied in prehistoric history, for it is a history we do not know. Very probably, it was exceedingly like the history we do know, except in the one detail that we do not know it. It is thus the very opposite of the pretentious prehistoric history which professes to trace everything in a consistent course, from the amoeba to the anthropoid and from the anthropoid to the agnostic. So far from being a question of our knowing all about queer creatures, very different from ourselves. They were very probably people very like ourselves, except that we know nothing about them. In other words, our most ancient records only reach back to a time when humanity had long been human and even long been civilized. The most ancient records we have not only mention but take for granted things like kings and priests and princes and assemblies of the people. They describe communities that are roughly recognizable as communities in our own sense. Some of them are despotic, but we cannot tell that they have always been despotic. Some of them may be already decadent, and nearly all are mentioned as if they were old. We do not know what really happened in the world before those records, but the little we do know would leave us anything but astonished if we learnt that it was very much like what happens in this world now. There will be nothing inconsistent or confounding about the discovery that those unknown ages were full of republics collapsing under monarchies and rising again as republics, empires expanding and finding colonies and then losing colonies, kingdoms combining again into world states and breaking up again into small nationalities, classes selling themselves into slavery and marching out once more into liberty, all that procession of humanity which may or may not be a progress but is most assuredly a romance. But the first chapters of the romance have been torn out of the book, and we shall never read them. It is so, also with a more special fancy about evolution and social stability. According to the real records available, barbarism and civilization were not successive stages in the progress of the world. They were conditions that existed side by side, as they still exist side by side. There were civilizations then, as there are civilizations now. There are savages now, as there were savages then. It is suggested that all men pass through a nomadic stage, but it is certain that there are some who have never passed out of it, and it seems not unlikely that there were some who never passed into it. It is probable that from very primitive times the static tiller of the soil and the wandering shepherd were two distinct types of men and the chronological rearrangement of them is but a mark of that mania or progressive stages that has largely falsified history. It is suggested that there was a communist stage in which private property was everywhere 
unknown, a whole humanity living on the negation of property. But the evidences of this negation are themselves rather negative. Redistributions of property, jubilees, and agrarian laws occur at various intervals and in various forms. But that humanity inevitably passed through a communist stage seems as doubtful as the parallel proposition that humanity will inevitably return to it. It is chiefly interesting as evidence that the boldest plans for the future invoke the authority of the past, and that even a revolutionary seeks to satisfy himself that he is also a reactionary. There is an amusing parallel example in the case of what is called feminism. In spite of all the pseudo-scientific gossip about marriage by capture and the caveman beating the cave woman with a club, it may be noted that as soon as feminism became a fashionable cry, it was insisted that human civilization in its first stage had been a matriarchy. Apparently, it was the cave woman who carried the club. Anyhow, all these ideas are little better than guesses, and they have a curious way of following the fortune of modern theories and fads. In any case, they are not history in the sense of record. And we may repeat that when it comes to record, the broad truth is that barbarism and civilization have always dwelt side by side in the world. The civilization sometimes spreading to absorb the barbarians, sometimes decaying into relative barbarism, and in almost all cases possessing, in a more finished form, certain ideas and institutions which the barbarians possess in a ruder form such as government or social authority, the arts, and especially the decorative arts, mysteries and taboos of various kinds, especially surrounding the matter of sex, and some form of that fundamental thing which is the chief concern of this inquiry, the thing that we call religion. Now Egypt and Babylon, those two primeval monsters, might in this matter have been specially provided as models, they might also be called working models to show how these modern theories do not work. The two great truths we know about these two great cultures happen to contradict flatly the two current fallacies which have just been considered. The story of Egypt might have been invented to point the moral that man does not necessarily begin with despotism because he is barbarous, but very often finds his way to despotism because he is civilized. He finds it because he is experienced, or what is often much the same thing, because he is exhausted. And the story of Babylon might have been invented to point the moral that man need not be a nomad or a communist before he becomes a peasant or a citizen and that such cultures are not always in successive stages, but often in contemporary states. Even touching these great civilizations with which our written history begins, there is a temptation, of course, to be too ingenious or too cocksure. We can read the bricks of Babylon in a very different sense from that in which we guess about the cup and ring stone. And we do definitely know what is meant by the animals in the Egyptian hieroglyphic as we know nothing of the animals in the Neolithic cave. But even here, the admirable archaeologists who have deciphered line after line of miles of hieroglyphics may be tempted to read too much between the lines. Even the real authority on Babylon may forget how fragmentary is his hard-won knowledge, may forget that Babylon has only heaved half a brick at him, though half a brick is better than no cuneiform. But some truths, historic and not prehistoric, dogmatic and not evolutionary, facts and not fancies, do indeed emerge from Egypt and Babylon. And these two truths are among them. Egypt is a green ribbon along the river edging the dark red desolation of the desert. It is a proverb and one of vast antiquity 
that it is created by the mysterious bounty and almost sinister benevolence of the Nile. When we first hear of Egyptians, they are living as in a string of riverside villages in small and separate but cooperative communities along the bank of the Nile. Where the river branched into the broad delta, there was traditionally the beginning of a somewhat different district or people. But this need not complicate the main truth. These more or less independent, though interdependent peoples were considerably civilized already. They had a sort of heraldry, that is, decorative art used for symbolic and social purposes. Each sailing the Nile under its own ensign representing some bird or animal. Heraldry involves two things of enormous importance to normal humanity. The combination of the two making that noble thing called cooperation. On which rest all peasantries and peoples that are free. The art of heraldry means independence. An image chosen by the imagination to express the individuality. The science of heraldry means interdependence, an agreement between different bodies to recognize different images, a science of imagery. We have here, therefore, exactly that compromise of cooperation between free families or groups, which is the most normal mode of life for humanity and is particularly apparent wherever men own their own land and live on it. With the very mention of the images of bird and beast, the student of mythology will murmur the word totem almost in his sleep. But to my mind, much of the trouble arises from his habit of saying such words as if in his sleep. Throughout this rough outline, I have made a necessarily inadequate attempt to keep on the inside rather than the outside of such things. To consider them where possible in terms of thought and not merely in terms of terminology. There is very little value in talking about totems unless we have some feeling of what it really felt like to have a totem. Granted that they had totems and we have no totems. Was it because they had more fear of animals or more familiarity with animals? Did a man whose totem was a wolf feel like a werewolf? Or like a man running away from a werewolf? Did he feel like Uncle Remus about Brayer Wolf? Or like Saint Francis about his brother the wolf? Or like Mowgli about his brothers the wolves? Was a totem a thing like the British lion or a thing like the British bulldog? Was the worship of a totem like the feeling of blacks about Mumbo Jumbo or of children about Jumbo? I have never read any book of folklore, however learned, that gave me any light upon this question, which I think by far the most important one. I will confine myself to repeating that the earliest Egyptian communities had a common understanding about the images that stood for their individual states, and that this amount of communication is prehistoric in the sense that it is already there at the beginning of history. But as history unfolds itself, this question of communication is clearly the main question of these riverside communities. With the need of communication comes the need of a common government and the growing greatness and spreading shadow of the king. The other binding force besides the king, and perhaps older than the king, is the priesthood. And the priesthood has presumably even more to do with these ritual symbols and signals by which men can communicate. And here in Egypt arose probably the primary and certainly the typical invention to which we owe all history and the whole difference between the historic and the prehistoric. The archetypal script, the art of writing. The popular pictures of these primeval empires are not half so popular as they might be. There is shed over them the shadow of an exaggerated gloom, more than the normal and even healthy sadness of heathen men. It is part of the same sort of secret pessimism that loves to make primitive man a crawling creature whose body is filth and whose soul is fear. It comes, of course, from the fact that men are moved most by their religion, especially when it is irreligion. 
For them, anything primary and elemental must be evil. But it is the curious consequence that while we have been deluged with the wildest experiments in primitive romance, they have all missed the real romance of being primitive. They have described scenes that are wholly imaginary in which the men of the Stone Age are men of stone like walking statues, in which the Assyrians or Egyptians are as stiff or as painted as their own most archaic art. But none of these makers of imaginary scenes have tried to imagine what it must really have been like to see those things as fresh which we see as familiar. They have not seen a man discovering fire like a child discovering fireworks. They have not seen a man playing with a wonderful invention called a wheel, like a boy playing at putting up a wireless station. They have never put the spirit of youth into their descriptions of the youth of the world. It follows that amid all their primitive or prehistoric fancies, there are no jokes. There are not even practical jokes in connection with the practical inventions, and this is very sharply defined in the particular case of hieroglyphics. Or, there seems to be serious indication that the whole high human art of scripture or writing began with a joke. There are some who will learn with regret that it seems to have begun with a pun. The king or the priests or some responsible persons wishing to send a message up the river in that inconveniently long and narrow territory hit on the idea of sending it in picture writing like that of the Red Indian. Like most people who have written picture writing for fun, he found the words did not always fit. But when the word for taxes sounded rather like the word for pig, he boldly put down a pig as a bad pun enchanced it, so a modern hieroglyphist might represent at once by unscrupulously drawing a hat followed by a series of upright numerals. It was good enough for the pharaohs and ought to be good enough for him, but it must have been great fun to write or even to read these messages when writing and reading were really a new thing. And if people must write romances about ancient Egypt, and it seems that neither prayers nor tears nor curses can withhold them from the habit, I suggest that scenes like this would really remind us that the ancient Egyptians were human beings. I suggest that somebody should describe the scene of the great monarch sitting among his priests, and all of them warring with laughter and bubbling over with suggestions as the royal puns grew more and more wild and indefensible. There might be another scene of almost equal excitement about the decoding of the cipher, the guesses and clues and discoveries having all the popular thrill of a detective story. That is how primitive romance and primitive history really ought to be written. For whatever was the quality of the religious or moral life of remote times, and it was probably much more human than is conventionally supposed. The scientific interest of such a time must have been intense. Words must have been more wonderful than wireless telegraphy, and experiments with common things a series of electric shocks. We are still waiting for somebody to write a lively story of primitive life. The point is, in some sense, a parenthesis here but it is connected with a general matter of political development by the institution which is most active in these first and most fascinating of all the fairy tales of science. It is admitted that we owe most of this science to the priests. Modern writers like Mr. Wells cannot be accused of any weakness of sympathy with a pontifical hierarchy, but they agree at least in recognizing what pagan priesthoods did for the arts and sciences. Among the more ignorant of the enlightened, there was indeed a convention of saying that priests had obstructed progress in all ages. And a politician once told me in a debate that I was resisting modern reforms exactly as some ancient priest probably resisted the discovery of wheels. I pointed out in reply that it was far more likely that the ancient priest made the discovery of the wheels. 
It is overwhelmingly probable that the ancient priest had a great deal to do with the discovery of the art of writing. It is obvious enough in the fact that the very word hieroglyphic is akin to the word hierarchy. The religion of these priests was apparently a more or less tangled polytheism of a type that is more particularly described elsewhere. It passed through a period when it cooperated with the king, another period when it was temporarily destroyed by the king, who happened to be a prince with a private theism of his own, and a third period when it practically destroyed the king and ruled in his stead. But the world has to thank it for many things which it considers common and necessary. And the creators of those common things ought really to have a place among the heroes of humanity. If we were at rest in a real paganism, instead of being restless in a rather irrational reaction from Christianity, we might pay some sort of pagan honor to these nameless makers of mankind. We might have failed statues of the man who first found fire, or the man who first made a boat, or the man who first tamed a horse. And if we brought them garlands or sacrifices, there would be more sense in it than in disfiguring our cities with cockney statues of stale politicians and philanthropists. But one of the strange marks of the strength of Christianity is that since it came, no pagan in our civilization has been able to be really human. The point is here, however, that the Egyptian government, whether pontifical or royal, found it more and more necessary to establish communication, and there always went with communication a certain element of coercion. It is not necessarily an indefensible thing that the state grew more despotic as it grew more civilized. It is arguable that it had to grow more despotic in order to grow more civilized. That is the argument for autocracy in every age, and the interest lies in seeing it illustrated in the earliest age. But it is emphatically not true that it was most despotic in the earliest age and grew more liberal in a later age. The practical process of history is exactly the reverse. It is not true that the tribe began in the extreme of terror of the old man and his seat and spear. It is probable, at least in Egypt, that the old man was rather a new man armed to attack new conditions. His spear grew longer and longer and his throne rose higher and higher as Egypt rose into a complex and complete civilization. That is what I mean by saying that the history of the Egyptian territory is in this the history of the earth, and directly denies the vulgar assumption that terrorism can only come at the beginning and cannot come at the end. We do not know what was the very first condition of the more or less feudal amalgam of landowners, peasants, and slaves in the little commonwealths beside the Nile but it may have been a peasantry of an even more popular sort. What we do know is that it was by experience and education that little commonwealths lose their liberty, that absolute sovereignty is something not merely ancient, but rather relatively modern, and it is at the end of the path called progress that men return to the king. Egypt exhibits in that brief record of its remotest beginnings the primary problem of liberty and civilization. It is the fact that men actually lose variety by complexity. We have not solved the problem properly any more than they did, but it vulgarizes the human dignity of the problem itself to suggest that even tyranny has no motive save in tribal terror. And just as the Egyptian example refused the fallacy about despotism and civilization, so does the Babylonian example refute the fallacy about civilization and barbarism. Babylon also we first hear of when it is already civilized, for the simple reason that we cannot hear of anything until it is educated enough to talk. It talks to us in what is called cuneiform that strange and stiff triangular symbolism that contrasts with the picturesque alphabet of Egypt. However relatively rigid Egyptian art may be, 
There is always something different from the Babylonian spirit which was too rigid to have any art. There is always a living grace in the lines of the lotus and something of rapidity as well as rigidity in the movement of the arrows and the birds. Perhaps there is something of the restrained but living curve of the river which makes us in talking of the serpent of old Nile almost think of the Nile as a serpent. Babylon was a civilization of diagrams rather than of drawings. Mr. W. B. Yeats, who has a historical imagination to match his mythological imagination, and indeed the former is impossible without the latter, wrote truly of the men who watched the stars from their pedantic Babylon. The cuneiform was cut upon bricks of which all their architecture was built up. The bricks were of baked mud, and perhaps the material had something in it permitting the sense of form to develop in sculpture or relief. Theirs was a static but a scientific civilization far advanced in the machinery of life and in some ways highly modern. It is said that they had much of the modern cult of the higher spinsterhood and recognized an official class of independent working women. There is perhaps something in that mighty stronghold of hardened mud that suggests the utilitarian activity of a huge hive. But though it was huge, it was human. We see many of the same social problems as in ancient Egypt or modern England. And whatever its evils, this also was one of the earliest masterpieces of man. It stood, of course, in the triangle formed by the almost legendary rivers of Tigris and Euphrates, and the vast agriculture of its empire on which its towns depended was perfected by a highly scientific system of canals. It had, by tradition, a high intellectual life, though rather philosophic than artistic. And there preside over its primal foundation those figures who have come to stand for the stargazing wisdom of antiquity, the teachers of Abraham, the Chaldees. Against the solid society, as against some vast bare wall of brick, there surged age after age the nameless armies of the nomads. They came out of the deserts where the nomadic life had been lived from the beginning where it is still left today. It is needless to dwell on the nature of that life. It was obvious enough and even easy enough to follow a herd or a flock which generally found its own grazing ground and to live on the milk or meat it provided. Nor is there any reason to doubt that this habit of life could give almost every human thing except a home. Many such shepherds or herdsmen may have talked in the earliest times of all the truths and enigmas of the book of Job, and of these were Abraham and his children, who have given to the modern world, for an endless enigma, the almost monomaniac monotheism of the Jews. But they were wild people without comprehension of complex social organization, and a spirit like the wind within them made them wage war on it again and again. The history of Babylonia is largely the history of its defense against the desert hordes, who came on at intervals of a century or two and generally retreated as they came. Some say that an admixture of nomad invasion built at Nineveh the arrogant kingdom of the Assyrians, who carved great monsters upon their temples, bearded bulls with wings like cherubim, and who sent forth many military conquerors who stamped the world as if with such colossal hooves. Assyria was an imperial interlude, but it was an interlude. The main story of all that land is the war between the wandering peoples and the state that was truly static. Presumably in prehistoric times and certainly in historic times, those wanderers went westward to waste whatever they could find. The last time they came, they found Babylon vanished. But that was in historic times, and the name of the leader was Muhammad. Now it is worthwhile to pause upon that story because, as has been suggested, it directly contradicts the impression still current 
The nomadism is merely a prehistoric thing and social settlement a comparatively recent thing. There is nothing to show that the Babylonians had ever wandered. There is very little to show that the tribes of the desert ever settled down. Indeed, it is probable that this notion of a nomadic stage followed by a static stage has already been abandoned by the sincere and genuine scholars to whose researches we all owe so much. But I am not at issue in this book with sincere and genuine scholars, but with a vast and vague public opinion which has been prematurely spread from certain imperfect investigations and which has made fashionable a false notion of the whole history of humanity. It is the whole vague notion that a monkey evolved into a man, and in the same way, a barbarian evolved into a civilized man. And therefore, at every stage, we have to look back to barbarism and forward to civilization. Unfortunately, this notion is in a double sense entirely in the air. It is an atmosphere in which men live rather than a thesis which they defend. Men in that mood are more easily answered by objects than by theories. And it will be well if anyone tempted to make that assumption in some trivial turn of talk or writing can be checked for a moment by shutting his eyes and seeing for an instant, vast and vaguely crowded, like a populous precipice, the wonder the Babylonian Wall. One fact does certainly fall across us like its shadow. Our glimpses of both these early empires show that the first domestic relation had been complicated by something which was less human but was often regarded as equally domestic. The dark giant called slavery had been called up like a genii and was laboring on the gigantic works of brick and stone. Here again, we must not too easily assume that what was backward was barbaric. In the matter of manumission, the earlier servitude seems in some ways more liberal than the later, perhaps more liberal than the servitude of the future. To ensure food for humanity by forcing part of it to work was, after all, a very human expedient, which is why it will probably be tried again. But in one sense, there is a significance in the old slavery. It stands for one fundamental fact about all antiquity before Christ, something to be assumed from first to last. It is the insignificance of the individual before the state. It was as true of the most democratic city-state in Hellas as of any despotism in Babylon. It is one of the signs of this spirit that a whole class of individuals could be insignificant or even invisible. It must be normal because it was needed for what would now be called social service. Somebody said, the man is nothing and the work is all, meaning it for breezy Carlylean commonplace. It was the sinister motto of the heathen servile state. In that sense, there is truth in the traditional vision of vast pillars and pyramids going up under those everlasting skies forever by the labor of numberless and nameless men toiling like ants and dying like flies, wiped out by the work of their own hands. But there are two other reasons for beginning with the two fixed points of Egypt and Babylon. For one thing, they are fixed in tradition as the types of antiquity, and history without tradition is dead. Babylon is still the burden of a nursery rhyme, and Egypt, with its enormous population of princesses awaiting reincarnation, is still the topic of an unnecessary number of novels. But a tradition is generally a truth, so long as the tradition is sufficiently popular, even if it is almost vulgar. And there is a significance in this Babylonian and Egyptian element in nursery rhymes and novels. Even the newspapers, normally so much behind the times, have already got as far as the reign of Tutankhamun. The first reason is full of the common sense of popular legend. It is the simple fact that we do know more of these traditional things than of other contemporary things. 
and that we always did. All travelers from Herodotus to Lord Carnarvon follow this route. Scientific speculations of today do indeed spread out a map of the whole primitive world, with streams of racial immigration or admixture marked in dotted lines everywhere, over spaces which the unscientific medieval map maker would have been content to call terra incognita. If he did not fill the inviting blank with a picture of a dragon to indicate the probable reception given to pilgrims, but these speculations are only speculations at the best, and at the worst, the dotted lines can be far more fabulous than the dragon. There is unfortunately one fallacy here into which it is very easy for men to fall, even those who are most intelligent and perhaps especially those who are most imaginative. It is the fallacy of supposing that because an idea is greater in the sense of larger, Therefore, it is greater in the sense of more fundamental and fixed and certain. If a man lives alone in a straw hut in the middle of Tibet, he may be told that he is living in the Chinese Empire, and the Chinese Empire is certainly a splendid and spacious and impressive thing. Or, alternatively, he may be told that he is living in the British Empire and be duly impressed. But the curious thing is that in certain mental states he can feel much more certain about the Chinese empire that he cannot see than about the straw hut that he can see. He has some strange magical juggle in his mind by which his argument begins with the empire, though his experience begins with the hut. Sometimes he goes mad and appears to be proving that a straw hut cannot exist in the domains of the dragon throne, that it is impossible for such a civilization as he enjoys to contain such a hovel as he inhabits. But his insanity arises from the intellectual slip of supposing that because China is a large and all-embracing hypothesis, therefore it is something more than a hypothesis. Now modern people are perpetually arguing in this way, and they extend it to things much less real and certain than the Chinese Empire. They seem to forget, for instance, that a man is not even certain of the solar system, as he is certain of the South Downs. The solar system is a deduction, and doubtless a true deduction. But the point is that it is a very vast and far-reaching deduction, and therefore he forgets that it is a deduction at all and treats it as a first principle. He might discover that the whole calculation is a miscalculation, and the sun and stars and street lamps will look exactly the same. But he has forgotten that it is a calculation and is almost ready to contradict the sun if it does not fit into the solar system. If this is a fallacy even in the case of facts pretty well ascertained, such as the solar system and the Chinese empire, it is an even more devastating fallacy in connection with theories and other things that are not really ascertained at all. Thus, history, especially prehistoric history, has a horrible habit of beginning with certain generalizations about races. I will not describe the disorder and misery this inversion has produced in modern politics. Because the race is vaguely supposed to have produced the nation, men talk as if the nation were something vaguer than the race. Because they have themselves invented a reason to explain the result, they almost deny the result in order to justify the reason. They first treat a Celt as an axiom, and then treat an Irishman as an inference. And then they are surprised that a great fighting, warring Irishman is angry at being treated as an inference. They cannot see that the Irish are Irish whether or no they are Celtic, whether or no there ever were any Celts. And what misleads them once more is the size of the theory the sense that the fancy is bigger than the fact. A great scattered Celtic race is supposed to contain the Irish, so of course, the Irish must depend for their very existence upon it. 
The same confusion, of course, has eliminated the English and the Germans by swamping them in the Teutonic race. Some tried to prove from the races being at one that the nations could not be at war. But I only give these vulgar and hackneyed examples in passing as more familiar examples of the fallacy. The matter at issue here is not its application to these modern things, but rather to the most ancient things. The more remote and unrecorded was the racial problem, the more fixed was this curious inverted certainty in the Victorian man of science. To this day, it gives a man of those scientific traditions the same sort of shock to question these things, which were only the last inferences when he turned them into first principles. He is still more certain that he is an Aryan even than that he is an Anglo-Saxon, just as he is more certain that he is an Anglo-Saxon than that he is an Englishman. He has never really discovered that he is a European, that he has never doubted that he is an Indo-European. These Victorian theories have shifted a great deal in their shape and scope. But this habit of a rapid hardening of a hypothesis into a theory and of a theory into an assumption has hardly yet gone out of fashion. People cannot easily get rid of the mental confusion of feeling that the foundations of history must surely be secure, that the first steps must be safe, that the biggest generalization must be obvious. But though the contradiction may seem to them a paradox, this is the very contrary of the truth. It is the large thing that is secret and invisible. It is the small thing that is evident and enormous. Every race on the face of the earth has been the subject of these speculations and it is impossible even to suggest an outline of the subject. But if we take the European race alone, its history or rather its prehistory has undergone many retrospective revolutions in the short period of my own lifetime. It used to be called the Caucasian race, and I read in childhood an account of its collision with the Mongolian race. It was written by Bret Hart and opened with a query, or is the Caucasian played out? Apparently, the Caucasian was played out, or in a very short time, he had been turned into the Indo-European man. Sometimes, I regret to say, proudly presented as the Indo-Germanic man. It seems that the Hindu and the German have similar words from mother or father. There were other similarities between Sanskrit and various Western tongues. And with that, all superficial differences between a Hindu and a German seemed suddenly to disappear. Generally, this composite person was more conveniently described as the Aryan, and the really important point was that he had marched westward out of those highlands of India where fragments of his language could still be found. When I read this as a child, I had the fancy that after all, the Aryan did not have marched westward and left his language behind him. He might also have marched eastward and taken his language with him. If I were to read it now, I should content myself with confessing my ignorance of the whole matter. But as a matter of fact, I have great difficulty in reading it now, because it is not being written now. It looks as if the Aryan is also played out. Anyhow, he has not merely changed his name, but changed his address, his starting place, and his route of travel. One new theory maintains that a race did not come to its present home from the east, but from the south. Some say the Europeans did not come from Asia, but from Africa. Some have even had the wild idea that the Europeans came from Europe, or rather that they never left it. Then there is a certain amount of evidence of more or less prehistoric pressure from the north, such as that which seems to have brought the Greeks to inherit the Cretan culture and so often brought the Gauls over the hills into the fields of Italy. But I merely mention this example of European ethnology to point out that the learned have pretty well boxed the compass by this time. And that I, who am not one of the learned, cannot pretend for a moment to decide where such doctors disagree. 
but I can use my own common sense, and I sometimes fancy that theirs is a little rusty from want of use. The first act of common sense is to recognize the difference between a cloud and a mountain, and I will affirm that nobody knows any of these things in the sense that we all know of the existence of the pyramids of Egypt. The truth it may be repeated is that what we really see is distinct from what we may reasonably guess. In this earliest phase of history is darkness covering the earth, and great darkness the peoples, with a light or two gleaming here and there on chance patches of humanity, and that two of these flames do burn upon two of these tall primeval towns. Upon the high terraces of Babylon and the huge pyramids of the Nile, there are indeed other ancient lights, or lights that may be conjectured to be very ancient in very remote parts of that vast wilderness of night. Far away to the east, there is a high civilization of vast antiquity in China. There are the remains of civilizations in Mexico and South America and other places, some of them apparently so high in civilization as to have reached the most refined forms of devil worship. But the difference lies in the element of tradition. The tradition of these lost cultures has been broken off, and though the tradition of China still lives, it is doubtful whether we know anything about it. Moreover, a man trying to measure the Chinese antiquity has to use Chinese traditions of measurement, and he has a strange sensation of having passed into another world under other laws of time and space. Time is telescoped outwards, and centuries assume the slow and stiff movement of eons. The white man trying to see it as the yellow man sees feels as if his head were turning round and wonders widely whether it is growing a pigtail. Anyhow, he cannot take in a scientific sense that queer perspective that leads up to the primeval pagoda of the first of the sons of heaven. He is in the real antipodes, the only true alternative world to Christendom, and he is after a fashion walking upside down. I have spoken of the medieval mapmaker and his dragon, but what medieval traveler, however much interested in monsters, would expect to find a country where a dragon is a benevolent and amiable being? Of the more serious side of Chinese tradition, something will be said in another connection, but here I am only talking of tradition and the test of antiquity, and I only mention China as an antiquity that is not for us reached by a bridge of tradition, and Babylon and Egypt as antiquities that are. Herodotus is a human being in a sense in which a Chinaman in a bellycock hat sitting opposite to us in a London tea shop is hardly human. We feel as if we knew what David and Isaiah felt like in a way in which we never were quite certain what Li Hung Chang felt like. The very sins that snatched away Helen or Bathsheba have passed into a proverb of private human weakness, of pathos, and even of pardon. The very virtues of the Chinamen have about them something terrifying. This is the difference made by the destruction or preservation of a continuous historical inheritance, as from ancient Egypt to modern Europe. But when we ask what was that world that we inherit, and why those particular people and places seem to belong to it, we are led to the central fact of civilized history. That center was the Mediterranean, which was not so much a piece of water as a world, but it was a world with something of the character of such a water for it became more and more a place of unification in which the streams of strange and very diverse cultures met. The Nile and the Tiber alike flow into the Mediterranean, so did the Egyptian and the Etrurian alike contribute to a Mediterranean civilization. The glamour of the great sea spread indeed very far inland, and the unity was felt among the Arabs alone in the deserts and the Gauls beyond the northern hills. But the gradual building up of a common culture running round all the coasts of this inner sea is the main business of antiquity. 
As will be seen, it was sometimes a bad business as well as a good business. In that Orvis terror room or circle of lands, there were the extremes of evil and of piety. There were contrasted races and still more contrasted religions. It was the scene of an endless struggle between Asia and Europe from the flight of the Persian ships at Salamis to the flight of the Turkish ships at Lepanto. It was the scene, as will be more especially suggested later, of a supreme spiritual struggle between the two types of paganism, confronting each other in the Latin and the Phoenician cities, in the Roman Forum and the Punic Mart. It was the world of war and peace, the world of good and evil, the world of all that matters most. With all respect to the Aztecs and the Mongols of the Far East, they did not matter as the Mediterranean tradition mattered and still matters. Between it and the Far East, there were, of course, interesting cults and conquests of various kinds, more or less in touch with it and in proportion as they were so intelligible also to us. The Persians came riding in to make an end of Babylon, and we are told in a Greek story how these barbarians learned to draw the bow and tell the truth. Alexander the Great Greek marched with his Macedonians into the sunrise and brought back strange birds, colored like the sunrise clouds and strange flowers and jewels from the gardens and treasuries of nameless kings. Islam went eastward into that world and made it partly imaginable to us, precisely because Islam itself was born in that circle of lands that fringed their own ancient and ancestral sea. In the Middle Ages, the empire of the Mughals increased its majesty without losing its mystery. The Tartars conquered China, and the Chinese apparently took very little notice of them. All these things are interesting in themselves. But it is impossible to shift the center of gravity to the inland spaces of Asia from the inland sea of Europe. And all is said, if there were nothing in the world but what was said and done and written and built in the lands lying around the Mediterranean, it would still be in all the most vital and valuable things the world in which we live. When that southern culture spread to the northwest, it produced many very wonderful things, of which doubtless we ourselves are the most wonderful. When it spread thence to colonies and new countries, it was still the same culture, so long as it was culture at all. But round that little sea like a lake were the things themselves, apart from all extensions and echoes and commentaries on the things, the Republic and the Church, the Bible and the heroic epics, Islam and Israel and the memories of the lost empires, Aristotle and the measure of all things. It is because the first light upon this world is really light, the daylight in which we are still walking today, and not merely the doubtful visitation of strange stars, that I have begun here with noting where that light first falls on the towered cities of the eastern Mediterranean. But though Babylon and Egypt have thus a sort of first claim in the very fact of being familiar and traditional, fascinating riddles to us, but also fascinating riddles to our fathers, we must not imagine that they were the only old civilizations of the Southern Sea, or that all the civilization was merely Sumerian or Semitic or Coptic, still less merely Asiatic or African. Real research is more and more exalting the ancient civilization of Europe and especially of what we may still vaguely call the Greeks. It must be understood in the sense that there were Greeks before the Greeks, as in so many of their mythologies there were gods before the gods. The island of Crete was the center of the civilization now called Minoan, after the Minos who lingered in ancient legend and whose labyrinth was actually discovered by modern archaeology, this elaborate European society, with its harbors and its drainage and its domestic machinery, seems to have gone down before some invasion of its northern neighbors, who made or inherited the Hellas we know in history.
but that earlier period did not pass till it had given to the world gifts so great that the world has ever since been striving in vain to repay them, if only by plagiarism. Somewhere along the Ionian coast, opposite Crete in the islands, was a town of some sort, probably of the sort that we should call a village or hamlet with a wall. It was called Aelion, but it came to be called Troy, and the name will never perish from the earth. A poet who may have been a beggar and a ballad monger, who may have been unable to read and write, and was described by tradition as blind, composed a poem about the Greeks going to war with his town to recover the most beautiful woman in the world. That the most beautiful woman in the world lived in that one little town sounds like a legend. That the most beautiful poem in the world was written by somebody who knew nothing larger than such little towns is a historical fact. It is said that the poem came at the end of the period, that the primitive culture brought it forth in its decay, in which case one would like to have seen that culture in its prime. But anyhow, it is true that this, which is her first poem, might very well be her last poem too. It might well be the last word, as well as the first word spoken by man about his mortal lot, as seen by merely mortal vision. If the world becomes pagan and perishes, the last man left alive would do well to quote the Iliad and die. But in this one great human revelation of antiquity, there is another element of great historical importance, which has hardly, I think, been given its proper place in history. The poet has so conceived the poem that his sympathies apparently and those of his readers certainly are on the side of the vanquished rather than of the victor. And this is a sentiment which increases in the poetical tradition even as the poetical origin itself recedes. Achilles had some status as a sort of demigod in pagan times, but he disappears altogether in later times. But Hector grows greater as the ages pass. And it is his name that is the name of a knight of the round table and his sword that legend puts into the hand of Roland, laying about him with a weapon of the defeated Hector in the last ruin and splendor of his own defeat. The name anticipates all the defeats through which our race and religion were to pass. That survival of a hundred defeats, that is its triumph. The tale of the end of Troy shall have no ending, for it is lifted up forever in the living echoes, immortal as her hopelessness and her hope. Troy standing was a small thing that may have stood nameless for ages, but Troy falling has been caught up in a flame and suspended in an immortal instant of annihilation, and because it was destroyed with fire, the fire shall never be destroyed. And as for the city, so would the hero. Traced in archaic lines in that primeval twilight is found the first figure of the night. There is a prophetic coincidence in his title. We have spoken of the word chivalry and how it seems to mingle the horseman with a horse. It is almost anticipated ages before and the thunder of the Homeric hexameter and that long leaping word with which the Iliad ends. It is that very unity for which we can find no name but the holy centaur of chivalry. But there are other reasons for giving in this glimpse of antiquity the flame upon the sacred town. The sanctity of such towns ran like a fire round the coasts and islands of the northern Mediterranean, the high-fenced hamlet for which heroes died. From the smallness of the city came the greatness of the citizen. Hellas with her hundred statues produced nothing statelier than that walking statue, the ideal of the self-commanding man. Hellas of the hundred statues was one legend in literature, and all the labyrinth of little walled nations resounded with the lament of Troy. A later legend, an afterthought but not an accident, said that stragglers from Troy founded a republic on the Italian shore. It was true in spirit that republican virtue had such a word.
The mystery of honor that was not born of Babylon or the Egyptian pride, there shone like the shield of Hector, defying Asia and Africa, till the light of a new day was loosened, the rushing of the eagles and the coming of the name, the name that came like a thunderclap when the world woke to rule.